This is a Mercedes-Benz G500 Cabriolet, and it is, quite simply, the world's most expensive Barbie Jeep. But it's my expensive Barbie Jeep. I bought this thing a few weeks ago, and today I'm going to review it. I've borrowed this G500 Cabriolet from, well, me. And yes, I did actually buy it. My regular viewers will know this is something of a rare event on this channel. Some car YouTubers buy a new car seemingly every week. For me, it's been over a year since I bought my last car, my Ford GT. Now, if you're wondering what would possess someone to buy this rather, uh, interesting looking vehicle. I'm going to attempt to explain myself tomorrow on my more Doug DeMuro second channel and kind of go through my reasons for buying this car. So be sure to check that out. Today, I'm going to give you a full review of one of the most unusual modern Mercedes-Benz models. And to be clear, yes, this is a Mercedes-Benz model. This is not modified, it is not a custom convertible. This is how Mercedes-Benz built it. This is how it left the factory. In fact, Mercedes-Benz has offered a convertible G-Wagon since the G-Wagon came out in the 1970s, and they sold it all the way through 2014. But it was never available here in North America. Now, to be clear, this is not a G650 Landau Lay, which was a special edition version of the G-Wagon made in the last few years that also had a convertible top. It was sold for well over a million dollars. This is far less expensive, although it is still absurdly overpriced. At the end of G Cabriolet production in 2014, the new sticker price on one of these was between $200,000 and $250,000. But this is a 1999 model, meaning that it's 20 years old, so it was nowhere near that expensive. So today, I'm going to take you on a tour of my new car. First, I'm going to show you around it, and I'm going to show you all of the interesting quirks and features of a very quirky vehicle. Then I'm going to get it out on the road and drive it, and then I'm going to give it a Doug score. And for more of my thoughts on the G500 Cabriolet, click the link below to visit autotrader.com slash oversteer, where I've also rounded up a list of the most interesting convertible SUVs currently listed for sale on Autotrader. All right, I'm gonna start the quirks and features of the G-Wagon Cabriolet with one of its biggest quirks, and that would be its styling, which is not all that good. And that is putting it charitably. I have used the term ugly. I have also used the term very ugly. The problem really is around here. Most convertibles just end at the top of the windshield, but this has all sorts of vehicle back there, and it just looks rather strange. Of course, it also looks rather strange to see a short, stubby G-Wagon, and frankly, it kind of looks like a Photoshop. In fact, if you look at the car from here forward, it just looks like a normal G-Wagon. Totally fine. Nothing weird there. But then you look around to the back, and you're like, oh, oh, <clears throat> well, well, huh. That's a decision. <laughs> it is really not all that attractive of a car, and I am well aware of that fact. In fact, earlier I called it the world's most expensive Barbie Jeep. I think a better way to describe it would be the world's most expensive Suzuki Sidekick, because frankly, that's exactly what it looks like. Just Mercedesified. So speaking of the top, let's discuss the most interesting quirk of the G500 Cabriolet, and that would be the cabriolet part. This car features a power top, which was introduced in the late 1990s for the G-Wagon Cabriolet. Not too many SUVs out there have a power convertible top. Unfortunately, the procedure for actually making the top do its thing 
is quite cumbersome. First, this car has to be in park. That was pretty standard back in the 90s for convertibles with power tops. But you also have to have the parking brake on just to make absolutely sure that you are completely stopped. Then you drop the sun visors in the passenger and driver's side and there are these little latches. You pull the latches down and only then is the top ready to do its thing. And the car lets you know that it's ready because once you've completed all these procedures to start the roof process, the convertible top button in the center console actually turns red to let you know that the conditions are met and now it's time to do the roof. And so, without further ado, let's do the roof. Now, once the roof gets to this point, you can hear it's beeping like crazy to let you know that it is still in process and that it's not fully latched yet. To stop the beeping and to completely close the roof, you pull down on this handle in the middle and you latch these latches above the sun visors and then the beeping stops, the roof is latched and the power top button in the center console turns off. It's no longer red, now it's dark again, until the next time you meet the conditions to put the roof back down. And now that the top is up, I wanna go back to discussing styling for a second because we haven't really improved things by putting up the top. In fact, in my opinion, they've only gotten worse. It did look like an ugly, stubby little Mercedes G-Wagon. Now it looks like an ugly, stubby little Mercedes G-Wagon wearing a toupee. <laughs> Putting the roof on does not enhance the appearance of this car. It does not make it any more attractive. It is quite simply an awkward looking car, whether the roof is up or down. That's just kind of the nature of the G-Cabrio. But with the roof on, some interesting quirks and features appear, probably the most obvious of which is these weird side windows here. Now, a lot of two-door SUVs have a triangular side window. This one has two. There's one here that's fixed in place, and there's another triangle side window in the roof itself. Very strange design, and I've always wondered why does this thing have to have two triangle-shaped side windows? Now that I own this car, I figured out the answer is there's a bar here for support and there's a bar here for support and Mercedes-Benz knew they couldn't put windows through those bars so they just decided to go with the next best thing. So as a result, down the side of this car you have a normal front window, a tiny triangle side window, and then another tiny triangle side window. Now the one benefit of this is if you're sitting in the back of the G Cabrio with the top up, you can choose which window you want to look out of. Do you want your upper triangle window or your lower triangle window? It's up to you to decide. And next up, speaking of interesting windows that are revealed when the top is put up, let's discuss the rear window. Now the rear window in this vehicle is not glass, it's plastic. It's not heated, it does not have a rear wiper, but it does have one cool party trick, namely the fact that it unzips. <laughs> <laughs> this, to me, is one of the most ridiculous aspects of the entire vehicle. It's where Mercedes-Benz decided to really embrace the Suzuki sidekickness of the whole thing. Can you imagine the meetings at Mercedes-Benz? We're making a convertible version of our luxury G-Wagon SUV, and it's going to cost over $100,000, and let's give it a zipper rear window. <laughs> But anyway, we've played around with the top being up for long enough. Now it's time to see what happens when the top goes back down. And by the way, I want to take a closer look at that convertible top button in the center console because it actually looks like a convertible top and you pull it in the direction you want the top to go. So if you pull it up, you're basically pulling it in the direction that you would pull it off the windshield if you had a manual top. You're just mimicking that motion. So you pull it up and then the top goes down and you have an open roof. If you push the top button, you're basically closing it down on the windshield 
field, and that's the motion that it goes in. It's a really, really cool top button that actually mimics the look of what happens with the top. But anyway, I will now put the top down, which means going back through the exact same procedure I went through to put it up. There is no just putting your top down on a whim at a stoplight in this car. You gotta go back to park, put the parking brake on, then drop the visors, pull down on the latches, then the beeping begins again, and then we pull up on the top button, and it begins. Now, once the top is fully in the down position, the beeping finally stops, but the top button is still lit up red, and it stays red until you relatch these things in order to confirm that you won't be putting the top back up or down. You close the visors, and then you are ready to drive. You can take the parking brake off, stick it in drive, and drive off. But although the convertible top procedure is rather interesting in this vehicle, there are a lot of other unusual quirks and features that are created by putting a power-operated convertible top on a Mercedes-Benz G-Wagon, and many of them are right back here. This is the cargo area. It's accessed through this rear tailgate, and of course, it is very unusual how it operates. For one thing, it doesn't lock. You can lock the doors to the car using the key or the remote, but this never actually locks. However, it's so complicated to get in that I'm not particularly worried about people getting back there. The procedure begins with moving the tire cover out of the way, which is complicated enough in itself. There's a little latch on the mechanism below the tire cover, you push that up, then you pull the handle, and then you pull the tire cover, and it swings out of the way. That gives you access to the cargo area door. Then, when you get to that point, you can pull on the cargo area, but you can't get it open. And that's because it's held in place by these two bolts at the top that are actually bolting the roof of the car onto the tailgate, and they're making sure that the roof and the tailgate both stay in place. In order to open the tailgate, you have to undo these bolts, and only then have you undone the tailgate from the roof, and then you can actually open it and access the cargo area. Now, once you've finally done all of this, you want to load some groceries into the car, you have to go through this entire procedure, you can see that the cargo area is reasonably well-sized, but not particularly large. It's about what you'd expect in a relatively small two-door vehicle that has two rows of seats and a folding convertible top that takes up a lot of the rear. And next up, another interesting item worth noting in the cargo area. Well, first off, this look. This is not a look you see very often in the G-Wagon. The tailgate down, the cargo area exposed, the wheel swung to the side looks very different from your regular standard four-door G-Wagon that basically everybody knows, which just has a rear door on the back. But the interesting thing I was going to mention is what's on the inside of this tailgate panel. You pop open this little latch, you twist it, and then the inside of the panel actually opens up and from there, you can access several different items that are in like a tray. There's a first aid kit in here, there's a warning triangle, there's a toe strap, there's a tool kit, and you can see this little decal on this plastic bag. This G-Wagon was just imported from Switzerland, and that decal is a Swiss vignette, which is like the permit they use every year that allows them to drive on Swiss roads. So you can clearly tell it was in Switzerland until very recently. But anyway, you can see this is a nice little cargo tailgate tray, and if you wanted to, you could take all of this stuff out, and put in some food, and have a nice little quirky picnic in the back of your G500 Cabriolet. Now, when you're done with your cargo area, as you might expect, the procedure to close it is pretty much the reverse of everything you did to get it open. First, you push this up, latch it, and then you have to secure these bolts in place. And once they're in, then you just go back to the tire cover, you close it using the latch, and then the rear of your G500 Cabriolet looks normal or at least as normal as it can for this vehicle. And next up, another interesting thing that comes up when you 
convertibilize a Mercedes G-Wagon is the chumzel. That would be the center high-mounted stoplight, or as you probably know it, the third brake light. Now, a lot of governments mandate a third brake light. You have two on the sides, of course, and then there's another one that has to be placed somewhere in the middle near the top of the rear of the car. Now, on a regular G-Wagon, it's just in the rear door, but this doesn't have a rear door, so they had to do something different. And oh boy, did they do something different. This is one of the strangest third brake lights you will ever see. It's just this bar that is welded on to the tire cover area, and then it just kind of sticks up and then curves and then points backward, and that's your G-Wagon Cabriolet third brake light. Again, this is totally factory, not modified. This is how Mercedes made this from the factory. And truthfully, it looks like a vacuum cleaner attachment or maybe some sort of animal that's curiously sticking its neck up to see what's going on in the world. And next up, another interesting thing that happens when you have a shortened G-Wagon is that the back seats become a little more unusual and a little bit more difficult to access than in the four-door. So to get into the back seats, you have the front seat here. There's a little latch on the bottom. You pull it, push the front seat forward, and it creates a little hole. And then you just climb yourself right in to the back seats. Now, I have to say that is harder than in a four-door G-Wagon, obviously, but it's still really easy for a two-door car. I have been in modern family SUVs where accessing the third row is more difficult than that simple mechanism. That is just fantastically easy, and there are some manufacturers of modern family SUVs that could learn a thing or two about rear seat access from this 20-year-old G-Wagon. One other benefit of that little lever and the mechanism that moves the seat forward is that when you put the seat back in place, your seat position is perfectly preserved. So unlike in most two-door vehicles where you have to then spend some time getting the back rest exactly where you want it because you've just let someone in the back seat, in this vehicle, not the case. The seating position never actually moves, just the entire seat springs forward. It's a brilliant design. Next up, another interesting item back here is something else Mercedes-Benz had to do in order to meet changing safety regulations throughout this vehicle's production run. They had to figure out a way to mount three-point rear seat belts. How do you do that in a vehicle with no point up here where you can put it? Well, the answer for Mercedes was they stuck this bar in the back seats on both sides, and then you have a place where you can mount the seat belt for the rear passengers. Now, next up, it's time to climb out of the back seat. And as much as I love that little lever that allowed me to get in here, when it's time to get out, we find a little flaw with it, specifically the fact that you can't really reach that lever which means you're kind of stuck back here until someone lets you out. Mercedes-Benz, for as brilliant as that lever situation is, they should have put a second one in the back seat so the rear passenger could have some access to the outside world. With that said, once you finally do get the front seat to fold forward, getting out of this car is easier than in basically any other two-door vehicle, even for someone my size. And next we move on to the front of my new G500 Cabriolet. I'm gonna take you through some of the interesting quirks and features up here, starting with the fact that as you can tell, this interior looks kind of old. This is the old school Mercedes-Benz interior like you would have gotten on a 1980s 300E or an old 560 SEL, Mercedes-Benz models from the 80s and maybe the early 90s. With that said, despite the kind of older look in this interior, this car does have a few modern luxury features. For example, example, it has heated seats. You push this button, it turns on the heated seats. And I have to say, these are the hottest heated seats I have ever felt. So hot that I can't believe it's not like illegal. It feels like you're sitting in a hot tub when you turn those things on. And I've actually owned several newer Mercedes-Benz models that also had heated seats that are nowhere near this hot. I suspect Mercedes toned down the heated seat heatness because it was just insanity from this era. And another nice luxury touch this car has is headlight washers. This little button here in the center control stack will turn them on. In case your headlights get dirty while you're off-roading, you can wash them. But maybe the most interesting modern luxury feature in this interior is right below the headlight washers. You can see there's this circle with green, yellow, and red lights. 
that's the parking sensor display. If you look around in the back bumper, there are parking sensors in this car. And when you approach something, it turns green, then yellow, then red. And these little lines in the middle are for a speaker that will sound to let you know you're getting too close. Now, right now, my parking sensors are a little screwed up. The red lights are stuck on and the sound comes on when I go into reverse. I'm going to try to get that fixed because I personally think that is one of the coolest old school parking sensor displays. Now, next up, another interesting item here moving down from the center control stack is the gear lever. You can see it says Mercedes on the top and then V8 right below that. And in fact, there are several V8 badges throughout this car. The floor mats do not say Mercedes, they say V8, both on the driver's side and on the passenger side. And on the front fenders, again, you have badges that say V8. So why was Mercedes-Benz so proud of making a V8? The reason is that earlier Mercedes-Benz G-Wagon Cabriolet models did not offer a V8. Mercedes-Benz only began adding one in 96, 97. And like I mentioned, this is a 99. And it was unusual at the time to get a V8 in a vehicle like this. The Jeep Wrangler didn't offer it. The Suzuki Sidekick didn't offer it. None of them did but this one did, and so there are V8 badges all over to kind of celebrate the fact that this was them stepping into a new territory. And next up, another interesting interior item here is to the left of the steering wheel, you can see you have the headlight control, but if you look a little further down, you can see there is another headlight control. So what exactly is going on here? Well, it turns out the top one actually turns on the headlights, the lower one adjusts where the headlights are positioned, and you can see there are five levels of adjustment. So if you think your headlights are too low, you can turn them higher, but if you wanna go off-roading and see what's right in front of you, you can turn them lower to see all the rocks and boulders you're gonna be climbing over. That is a really cool feature. And next up, another interesting item in this vehicle is the operation of the climate control, specifically the fact that air can conditioning comes out of all the climate vents like you'd expect, but heat only comes out the side vents, the one to the left of the steering wheel and over on the passenger side of the dashboard. Now, I thought this was an error at first, but I found an English translation of the owner's manual. I looked it up and indeed, that's how it was designed. So heat only comes out those two vents, not the middle vent. The middle vent only gives you air conditioning. I will say though, with the heat on, this car does an amazing job of blowing a lot of hot air out those vents. And when you put on the heat and combine that with the hot tub style heated seats, it can be pretty toasty in this car, even on a cool night with the roof down. Put the roof up and it becomes oppressively hot very quickly. So the climate control system works really well. And next up, one other interesting item in this interior, you drop the sun visor and I absolutely love this decal. It's warning you not to put the sun visor up while the top is in motion because of those little top latches that I showed you before. This decal is so cool and I'm pretty sure it was only used on the G-Wagon Cabriolet. You can see it says 463 at the start of the number on this decal. That's the part number and this was the 463 chassis G-Wagon and so I think they made that decal just for this vehicle and it is a cool looking and rather rare decal in the world of Mercedes-Benz warning labels. And next up, moving back to the outside of the G500 Cabriolet, for as strange looking as this vehicle is, I think it looks better than a lot of the other G Cabriolets from its era because mine has been modernized. Now, as you know, Mercedes built this body style of G-Wagon up until last year. And so if you have an older one, you can just swap out parts to make it look like a newer one. And that's exactly what's been done here. So I have a new grill from a newer G-Wagon that makes it look a little bit more modern in the front. I have new wheels from like a 2008, 2009 model that also helps to modernize it. These running boards were not included in the 1999 models. Mercedes didn't actually start adding these until they started shipping the G-Wagon to the United States in 2002. But again, it kind of helps make it look a little bit more modern than it otherwise would. And another change on the outside of this car is the mirrors, which come from a newer G500. The mirrors had to be changed in order to get this car legalized to be imported into the United States, which I'll cover more in tomorrow's More Doug video about buying this car. But anyway, these mirrors are from a newer G-Wagon with the mirror turn signals, and they also help contribute to a more modern look. Now, next up, one exterior change that I really don't like 
like is the side exhaust. The AMG G-Wagon models had this. Mercedes never made an AMG G-Wagon Cabrio, so this thing should not have that side exhaust, but the prior owner must have added it. I think it looks kind of showy and obnoxious, and I prefer my cars to have a more stock and original look, so I might just get rid of it, but either way, that's a change that was made at some point in this car's prior ownership. And finally, we move under the hood, where you can see the 5-liter V8 in this thing, which Mercedes-Benz called the M113 V8. It made about 300 horsepower, which isn't that much, but it's a pretty healthy figure in a vehicle the size of a Jeep Wrangler, especially in an older G-Wagon like this that lacks a lot of the modern luxury and safety and technology features that would have added weight. So it's reasonably powerful considering what it is. Now, Mercedes offered the M113 V8 in many different vehicles for the U.S. market, including the G-Wagon when it first came here in 2002 as a four-door, but this one did have to be modified a little bit in order to get it to comply with USA and with California regulations, so it's not quite the same one we would have gotten in the States, but it's really similar. And so those are the quirks and features of the ultra-quirky Mercedes-Benz G500 Cabriolet. Now it's time to get it out on the road and drive it. All right, driving the ridiculous G500 Cabriolet. I'm sorry if you can tell if my voice is kind of going. I had a cough and now it seems like I'm losing my voice such as life. Now, undoubtedly, the thing that I like the most about this vehicle is how it drives. I was not expecting that. Um, I thought I would love the power top, the added features compared to my Defender, but actually, it, the way that it drives is incredible. It feels like, like a mountain goat. Um, it accelerates tremendously well. The small body, really, you feel like you can kind of run over everything. Very eager, very capable of going fast and doing what's asked of it. But most importantly, it is just incredibly smooth to a degree that I was not at all expecting. The Defender bumps along so much. You hear so many rattles and clanks, not all that well built. This thing, not at all. You can drive this on the highway with the roof down and have a conversation with your rear passenger, um, which is just a totally different world than I'm used to in my convertible SUV, my other one. From the front, the driving position is pretty much exactly like a regular G-Wagon. Um, you see out over the square hood, which has always been kind of a cool look, and you have this kind of tall feel. I also just love the dimensions of this vehicle because it's relatively narrow, so you can kind of get through anything. Another impressive thing is that with the roof up, you basically hear nothing in here. The roof will flap just a little bit, but it is incredibly well insulated from the outside. Um, just a really, really impressive experience compared to what I was used to in my Defender, compared to what you'd be used to if you drove a Wrangler from this era, a YJ or a TJ. Despite all of the bodywork on the top half of this car, you do feel totally open when you have the roof down. You feel like a true convertible with the world around you and the wind in your hair. It does feel like that, but unlike a lot of convertibles, you have triple lockers and you can pretty much go anywhere. One interesting thing, I bought this car about two weeks ago and I've been driving, I've driven it 390 miles since I bought it and one person has noticed it. Um, it definitely does not stand out all that much. The color is a part of it. I figured though I was worried people would be freaking out and it'd be kind of embarrassing because I find the G-Wagon in general to be kind of embarrassing, but that's not happened. Um, instead, nobody really pays all that much attention. Maybe people look at it on the road and don't say anything to me, but I haven't had any comments or anything like that, um, which I'm thrilled about. I, I, I really don't like cars that are too showy and this one blends in more than I was expecting. Surprisingly, removing the roof from a G-Wagon does not have all that much effect in how it feels on the road. It still feels very sturdy. It still corners very stable. The steering feels heavy, and that really, really shocks me. I was absolutely not expecting that. I thought removing the roof would destroy the rigidity and change the driving experience, but really this just feels like a G-Wagon, but it happens to not have a top. Ultimately, when I got this car, I was not really sure if I would love it. Um, I knew I would love the features, the power top, um, the off-road capability, some of this new stuff, heated seats that I haven't had in my Defender, but I wasn't really sure if I would actually love the car. Um, and I go into the G-Wagon with a little bit of a raised eyebrow because I've, I've always kind of thought they're for 
people who want to show off and stick it in your face that they have money and all that. And quickly, it is already kind of eclipsing my Defender as like the car that I always want to get into every morning when I'm going somewhere, um, which is a really big deal because it's been the Defender for three years. And I think that is a really, really special thing. And so that's my Mercedes G500 Cabriolet. Now, like I mentioned, I'm going to explain why I bought this thing tomorrow in a video on my More Doug DeMuro second channel, because I'm sure a lot of you are wondering what would possess someone to purchase this vehicle. It's a fair question, but at least you must agree that this is a perfectly quirky car for someone who loves quirks and features. Anyway, now it's time to give the G500 Cabriolet a Doug score. Starting with the weekend categories and styling, the G500 Cabriolet is, uh, well, it gets a 4 out of 10. Acceleration, it's quick for a G-Wagon from its era, but still too slow for anything more than a 1 out of 10. Handling is good, far better than the larger front-heavy G65 I tested and admonished two years ago, but it's still not that great. It gets a 4 out of 10. Fun factor is good between its convertible top-down driving fun and its off-road capabilities, and it gets a 7 out of 10. Cool factor is debatable, but I think these are cool, obviously, I own it, but it certainly would turn heads at a Cars and Coffee, and it gets a 7 out of 10 for a total weekend score of 23 out of 50. Next up are the daily categories and features. It has some nice luxuries like heated seats, keyless entry, a power top, but it's not exactly loaded by modern standards, and it gets a 4 out of 10. Comfort is good, the ride is much better than my Defender or a Jeep from this era, but it's still not exactly luxurious, and it gets a 6 out of 10. Quality is decent, the G-Wagon is not my favorite vehicle in terms of build quality with big panel gaps, but at least this one has a famously reliable V8 engine, and it gets a 6 out of 10. Practicality is normal for a convertible like this, and it gets a 4 out of 10. Finally, value, and these go for over $100,000. Yes, that's ridiculous. Yes, that's what I paid, and it's a hard figure to justify when a regular four-door G-Wagon from this era sells for about 30, but life is about supply and demand, and the supply of these is just minuscule. Still, it's a small number of crazy people willing to pay that much for this thing, and it gets a 4 out of 10 for a total daily score of 24 out of 50. Add it up and the Doug score is 47 out of 100, which places it here against some other SUV convertibles, luxury convertibles, and weird off-roaders. It doesn't do very well, and indeed it's, well, an odd choice. But I love it, and it beats out the Nissan Murano Cross Cabriolet and the Range Rover Evoque convertible, and that's really important when you're buying an SUVertible.